motion. I tell you that this is the Office of the Public Project and other space number 02349. May it please you, my lord. Uh, we, we propose to address uh, five topics. Uh, the, the first is the <coughs> declaratory order, together with the mandamus, and the notice of motion. Um, it, it's in various places, but I'm using the one at item 12, uh, page eight, 18 to 10. Uh, the, the, the declaratory order is paragraph 2, which is declaring the conduct of the first and or second respondent in refusing to pay the applicant a gratuity due and payable to her to be unconstitutional and invalid in terms of section 172.1a and the related mandamus is at page 1811 which is item, a paragraph 3 granting just and equitable remedies in terms of section 172.1b including but not limited to severance and or an order directing the first and second respondent to take the necessary steps to ensure payment of the gratuity forthwith and or by no later than 30 days after the date of this order. So that will be item number one. I'll demonstrate to your lordship why there is no clear right established. And then the next is to address the prayer five, which is the declaration that the conduct of the respondents is in breach of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. It says breach of clause three, but it should be section 32 of the BCEA, according to the argument. In fact, terms of section three of the BCEA. So that will be the second topic, is to address the BCEA cause of action. The third topic is to address the review under PAJA. And that is paragraph six of the notice of motion. The fourth topic is to address the review under legality. It is also encapsulated in paragraph six of the notice of motion. The last topic is costs. So if I could then start with the declaratory relief. Uh, yes, my lord, I'm reminded, I almost forgot that I had planned to hand up to your lordship the documents that should have been removed from case lines, but they are still there uh, in light of the judgment by uh, uh, Justice Van Nieuwenhuizen. So it's just to indicate which ones were removed so that when your lordship reads through this, you don't get yourself... Uh, confused. Uh, uh, removed in what sense, Mr. Uh, because they were struck out. Oh, I see. Yes. And so, with a strike out, if it's a paragraph, you black it out. If it's an actual affidavit, you remove it from the file. But that doesn't seem to have happened. So it's just to hand you these documents and say, if you see these documents in case lines, ignore I, I, them. I shouldn't consider them for my determination. Yes, indeed. I could... Maybe it's easier to just tell you where they appear in the pages rather than giving you a hard copy. So yes. They appear at item 02107 to item 02160. 160. Yes. 02160 and the first is 02107. So that is what was struck out. So that should not be considered. So... <clears throat> if I could then return to the, the declaratory order. The declaratory order is based first on the conditions of service. Number two, on some selected provisions of the Constitution. Number three, on the BCEA. And number four, on the Public Protector Act 
<coughs> but in order to succeed, the applicant must prove a clear right because what he seeks is a final relief. And because he also seeks, she also seeks a mandamus under paragraph 3 of the notice of motion, they must satisfy the requirement for a final interdict, which are contained in Setlochelo versus Setlochelo. And your lordship knows this. There are three. They must demonstrate a clear right, a threatened invasion or an actual invasion of that right, and the absence of satisfactory alternatives. Yesterday, we heard that she says she only needs to establish a prima facie right. That is incorrect. An applicant for final relief must satisfy the requirements in Setlochel versus Setlochel. The fact that this is constitutional relief against organs of state does not unshackle the applicant from the burden to prove the elements for final relief. The fact that you say, I, I want a declaration of unconstitutionality does not mean you must not establish a clear right. And this applies across the orders. It applies to the declaration. It applies to the claim under the PCA, which is framed as a mandamus. But it also applies to the Paja case. Now, on Paja, the point is also trite. It's made in Zuma versus NDPP, uh, the judgment reported in 2009, volume 2, SA 277. It's a judgment by the SCA at paragraphs 26 and 27. Not only do they make the point about the need to establish a clear right when one approaches a court for final relief, but they also make it clear what the standard of proof is, that the Plascon Evans standard applies. So nothing really changes on the law just because the label attached is constitutional relief. There is still a burden to discharge on the part of the applicant. So then, as an introduction to the declaratory relief, there are two preliminary questions to be addressed. The first is, what is the status of the conditions of service? And the second is, what is the status of the applicant? Both of these topics seem to have been elided yesterday. In so far as the conditions of service are concerned, the starting point is, that, is the Constitution in Section 219. Uh, which establishes the basis for the conditions of service. The full constitution, and this will surprise you, my lord, but my attorneys managed to copy the whole constitution, and it appears at item 20 uh, from... 2019-08. The relevant section is 2019-86, which deals with the remuneration of persons holding public office. And section 2195 says that national legislation must establish frameworks for determining the salaries, allowances, and benefits of judges, the public protector, the auditor general and members of any commission provided for in the Constitution, including the Broadcasting Authority, referred to in Section 192. So what we know from that is that the Constitution itself does not determine the salaries, allowances, and benefits, nor does it require the national legislation to determine the salaries, allowances, and benefits. It requires the national legislation only to set out the framework for the determination of the salaries, allowances, and benefits. The national legislation 
that has been passed pursuant to section 219 subsection 5 that is relevant to the public protector is the public protector act itself it is also included in the authorities bundle and it starts at page 20 2052 and it deals in express terms with the framework for the determination of the salaries, allowances, and benefits. And you will find this at section two thereof. Now, there's some explanation needed here because there's confusion in the founding affidavit. Section two, subsection two, was inserted into the act on the 1st of April, 2019. Prior to that, the previous section required the National Assembly to determine the salaries, and then it had a, a final phrase, conditions of employment. That was the previous, 20, before 2019. That was then deleted by the, by the legislature. <clears throat> The confusion really arises because in paragraph 57 of the founding affidavit of the applicant, she quotes the old unamended section. The, the section from 2019, 1st of April 2019, is the section that appears at 20 stroke 2054. And what that requires is that it's no longer determined by the National Assembly, but what happens is a two-stage process. One is that the public protector shall be entitled to such salary allowances and benefits as determined by the president from time to time by notice in the Gazette after taking into consideration the recommendations of the independent commission. And that independent commission is defined at item 20 stroke 2053. It's the Independent Commission for the Remuneration of Public Office Bearers, uh, and that's established under that Act. So what happens is the process starts with the Independent Commission. It then goes to the President, who makes a determination. And then under subsection B, it is then approved by the National Assembly in terms of section 2C. And then Section 2C simply sets out the procedure that must be followed by the National Assembly when it approves the determination made by the President on the recommendation of the Independent Commission. So what we know then is that the current service conditions predate the 2019 amendment. These were the conditions that were determined under the unamended provision prior to the introduction of section 2, subsection 2. But it's crucial to just remember that there, there is an error in the, in the founding affidavit. But that error is addressed in the answering affidavit. It's also addressed in the heads of argument. But I was surprised to hear that it was repeated yesterday. So what we know then is that the service condition... Uh, forgive me. On, on the case pleaded by the applicant, does anything turn on her reliance on the pre-amendment? Yes, only in this sense, because you remember that when your lordship uh, was debating what is the status of the conditions of service, the attempt was made to equate them to legislation. Uh, so in that sense, they are not legislation. What they are is terms of employment equivalent to a contract. Because what my learned friend tried to suggest was that because it was an act of parliament, or let's say an action of parliament. It was enjoying the same status as an act of parliament. That's a mistaken submission. The constitution doesn't set the salary benefits or allowances. 
national legislation also doesn't do so. And then Parliament determined those in, uh, terms and conditions that we have. And under the new act, the function is now allocated to the president. So if one made the error of equating that determination to legislation, you would then ha have the oddity of the president drafting the law. So th that's the first question to be clarified, is that the service conditions are not legislation. They also are not the con uh, a provision in the Constitution. What they are is a subsidiary action that has the force of contract. And this will be important when we deal with PAJA, because there is also a lot of fallacy that is made in relation to, to PAJA. So, so much then for the status of the conditions of service. They, they, they have no force of the constitution, no force of statute, but only force of contract. What about the status of the public protector? This has been dealt with before uh, by the Western Cape Division. We've in fact found the two authorities. Um, remember that yesterday there was constant reference to the public protector as an employee um, who is entitled to rely on section 23 of the Constitution and the BCEA. There are two judgments of the Western Cape Division, uh, full bench judgments. Uh, perhaps I should just hand them up um, so that I think they are, in fact, on case lines. That might be better to just take your lordship to the case line references. The first one is would, the. Would that be under authorities? Uh, sorry, my lord. Would that be under authorities? Under authorities, yes. Under, it's item 20, 2192. So 20 stroke 2192. Yes. So if you are in that judgment, um, your Lordship should look at paragraph 78. Is that Millennium Ways? Uh, no, my Lord. Oh, which, it's, which one? It's, it's the Public Protector of SA versus the Speaker of the National Assembly. Uh, so it's under item 20 slash 2192. So if you are there, my Lord, uh, may I ask that you look at paragraph 78, which is at 20 slash 2213. All right. So if you look at paragraph 78, the judgment makes it clear, Advocate Mkwebane clearly does not enjoy the status of an employee. Rather, she is a constitutional office bearer, and Advocate Mkwebane's right to institute the now new rescission application is in no possible way compromised by the continuation of the parliamentary impeachment process. So at that point, she was trying to stop the parliamentary impeachment process, and the issue of whether she was an employee or not arose. But it's clearly decided there that she's not an employee. And then there is an earlier judgment, which is uh, also a full bench judgment of the Western Cape Division, uh, also called Public Protector versus Speaker of the National Assembly. We attach this to item 20 slash 2231. So 20 slash 2231. And it was also another attempt at stopping the impeachment process. Uh, 
and the relevant paragraph there is paragraph 90, which is at item 20 slash 2289. And so it's what's important about that paragraph is that it just affirms the, the history I've just given about the amendment of 2019. So towards the end of paragraph 90, the following appears. It records the submission made by the respondents. The respondents also contended that the applicant and the 16th respondent's reliance on the Public Protector Act was wholly misplaced and pointed out that following an amendment to the determination of remuneration of office bearers of Independent Constitutional Laws Amendment Act 22 of 2014 with effect from 1 April 2019. None of the references in the Public Protector Act as an employee and her terms of conditions of employment remain. So the first judgment makes it clear that she is not an employee. The second judgment contextualizes that it's true that before 2019, there was the odd reference to the conditions of employment. That was struck out and replaced by section two, subsection two of the final act. So two things that are clear from the analysis I've just given. The first is that the conditions of service do not have the force of a statute or the constitution. They only have a contractual force. The second is that the public protector is not an employee. She is an independent holder of a constitutional office. So then, to then come to the decision itself that is the subject of the uh, controversy, the, it's necessary to just, again, correct the, the incorrect submissions that were made yesterday about what the decision was and what were the reasons given at the time. So what we know, and I will ask your Lordship to have regard to item 26, which is the Rule 53 record. So what we know is that the starting point is a request, and the request is at item 26. Uh, page 833, um, so it's all under the record. So item 26, stroke 833. So wh what we know on the facts is that there is a request dated the 6th of December 2023 by Ms. Mkweban. In paragraph two of that request, she makes the following assertions. Paragraph 2.1, she says, our client vacated office on or about 12 September 2023, one month before the expiry of her term of office. That's the first point that she makes. The second point is 2.2, where she says, as you are aware, and in terms of our client's conditions of service, and in particular clause th thereof, our client is entitled to payment of a gratuity. So we, we know for sure here that what she says is the basis for a claim is a vacation of office prior to the expiry of a term of office. And number two, the legal basis that she asserts is the conditions of service. Now that never changes at all. Um, in the exchange until the decision is made and the decision is a couple of pages after 8.33 it is at 26.844 and that's the response now might I just mention that when I say decision I do so without prejudice to the Parliament's rights to, to argue that it is not a decision. But we've certainly taken the view that a decision was taken. Um, so at paragraph, is at item 26, stroke 844, there is then a response to the request. So 
to just recap, the request is I've vacated my office before the lapse of my term. Number two, the sole basis for the payment is the conditions of service. What is then stated to her in response starts at paragraph 2.1. Number one, your client was removed as the public protector via the adoption of a resolution by the National Assembly and the resolution was confirmed and executed by the president. Your client did not vacate the office of her own volition. So paragraph 2.1 already tells her that there is a resolution of the National Assembly and there is a confirmation and execution of that resolution by the president. Two additional facts. And then 2.2, the conditions of service only authorize the payment of a gratuity when the incumbent has vacated office, not when the incumbent is removed from office. Paragraph um, 2.3, apart from the conditions of service, there is no other authority that our client is aware of, including the Constitution as well as the Public Protector Act, which permits our client to consider paying your client a gratuity under circumstances where an incumbent is removed from office. And then the last paragraph, in the circumstances, our client regrets to inform your client that there is no enabling provision in the determination of the conditions of service of a public protector, which authorizes the payment of a gratuity as provided for in paragraph 3.1 of the conditions of service of the public protector, if his or her term of office ends by virtue of his or her removal by the president in terms of section 194 of the constitution. So she is told that if you are removed pursuant to Section 194 of the Constitution, which is a removal for misconduct, removal for incapacity, and if that removal is based on a resolution by the National Assembly confirmed by the President, you are not entitled to a gratuity. It's in the letter, all of it is in the letter. There are then, so it's, it's then clear then that the accusation that was repeatedly made with a lot of reckless abandon yesterday that new reasons have been inserted is unfounded. So to complete the picture here, there are two additional facts that are mentioned in the letter. One is resolution by the National Assembly. The second is the decision by the President under Section 194 of the Constitution. We know where those are in the record as well because they are encapsulated in the decision of the 12th of February 2024. So to start with the resolution of the National Assembly, that is at page 26.414. Uh, stroke 414. Yes. And if you turn the page to 26416, and it first records signed by the Secretary of Parliament. So at the end of that page, it says, question agreed to, recommendation for removal of Advocate Bim Kwebana from the office of public protector in terms of section 194 1c of the constitution <coughs> accordingly agreed to so that's the resolution passed by parliament then that's the first document it's clear it's, parliament is acting under section 194 the second document referred to in the letter of the 12th is the decision by the president they say parliament has resolved to remove you under section 194 the president has executed that decision, also under 194. That you will find at 26 stroke 417. And the last paragraph is the relevant one, which is, says, I therefore, that's President Ramaphosa then says, I therefore hereby inform you that you are hereby removed from the office of the public protector in terms of section 194 3b of the constitution on the grounds of misconduct and incompetence and then he attaches the presidential act but the presidential act is basically the same document 
just signed by him. So the three, the two documents that are then encapsulated in the letter of the 12th of February 2024 could not have created any confusion that the reason for the disentitlement to the gratuity is a removal under Section 194 of the Constitution and a passage of the resolution by the Parliament and the endorsement thereof by the President. They all make it abundantly clear that the reason is removal and they also set out the cause of the removal, which is Section 194 of the Constitution. So, so on the facts, that is what uh, transpired. And in fact, I noticed when this was read that actually the other passages were just not read yesterday. So can we then go to whether or not she has established an entitlement to the conditions of service? Now that we know that the letter she wrote to the public protector, I mean, I know she complains at some point that the public protector has no power, but she is the one who asked for gratuity from the public protector. So we know that the, the only basis that she claimed she wanted payment was clause three of the conditions of service. She never said she wanted payment under any other basis. The rest appears in the pleadings, but it does not appear in the letter that she wrote upon which the decision was then made. So what about whether she has made out a case under the conditions of service themselves? Now that turns on the interpretation of the conditions of service. In other words, can she prove a clear right to payment of a gratuity under the conditions of service, which is what she is obliged to do. The conditions of service, they also appear in different parts, but I'm using item uh, 18, page 39. Item 18, uh, stroke 39. So they deal with uh, eight items, and gratuity is a third item. Uh, so we've got to then construe that properly. So we submit that there are four textual indicators there that make it clear that there is no entitlement to a gratuity where the public protector is removed on account of misconduct and incompetence as envisaged in Section 184 of the Constitution. And in fact, in her own letter, she incorrectly said, I vacated office prior to the lapse of my term of office. So which you can't vacate before the, the lapse of the term, uh, except for the three factors I will outline now. So the first indicator is, of course, the heading. The heading is gratuity. It's not salary, it's not medical benefit, it's not an allowance, it's a gratuity. It's a, a genus on its own. The reason why that is important is because of the cases that we rely upon at pa paragraph 7.1 to 7.4 of our heads of argument. Uh, your Lordship knows the law on this uh, heading uh, must be taken into account in construing the meaning of a provision. So 
When it says gratuity, that is not inserted there for gratuitous reasons. It's inserted because it has a consequence for meaning. The first case is Welch. My learned friend took no issue with the case of Welch. The only point he made was that it is a tax case and therefore inapplicable. But it may be a tax case, but it is explaining or explicating what gratuity means. And it makes it clear that when something is paid as a gratuity, it's motivated by pure liber liberality and not in expectation of any quid pro quo of whatever kind. And then in 7.2... Um, uh, Mr. Kukatobi, I just wanted to debate Welsh with you. Um, I understood the fundamental claim that is made by the by your client uh, to be that Welsh is an authority for the proposition that there is never a legal basis to a gratuity. No, no we say that when you see the heading in item 3, gratuity, that should give you an indicator that a gratuity is not something you can demand as of right. Yes, no, no, I understand that, but uh, uh, in, your, in your submissions, um, you seek to make a more fundamental assertion, i.e. that there is, never a legal under, there is never a legal basis to a gratuity. Yes. Now, the issue of liberality and so forth, um, that is more of an explanation of the, um, the statement i.e. in law you can't claim um, a gratuity as a matter of law and the reason for that is because a gratuity, the nature of a gratuity is liberality of conduct on the part of the uh, Yes, your lordship has got it correct. But I do not read Welsh to make that statement. Yes. Uh, your lordship should guide me about precisely where the concerns are. Yes, w well, um, on the point of there in law never being a legal basis to a gratuity. Oh yes, no, no, no. I, I think I should then uh, state the proposition uh, less forcefully and simply rest with one baseline, which is there is no entitlement. You cannot go to court and say, I am forcing the employer to pay me a gratuity. Uh, which is not the same thing as saying a statute may not create a gratuity that is enforceable or an employer themselves may not create conditions of service where a gratuity is enforceable. Yes, so, but, but even that proposition seems to be incorrect. Um, uh, for example, when, when you have regard to the following decision. Uh, quantum. Uh, uh, no, not quantum. Uh, um, quantum, in my view, is a misreading of Welch. Yes. Uh, Let me just, just find I, Welch. I, I, I do need to uh, um, draw attention to... Okay. 1812. Yes. Yes, uh, Welch is at item 20... One eight one three. Yeah, with Welsh, the issue as to the nature of a gratuity that appears in paragraph the twenty one, I believe. Um, uh, thirty one. Thirty one. But uh, Welsh didn't go any further. Um, quite apart from the fact that um, that was not an issue for determination in that in that case. Well, my lord, could I just ask your lordship to go to item twenty? 1823. Item 20? Yes, 1823. 
So uh, it's paragraph 30 and 31. <coughs> yes. Uh, so paragraph 30 says, if one were to scour the distinctions to find a single world, apt to convey that the disposition should be motivated by pure liberality and not in expectation of any quid pro quo of whatever kind, one would not find a better or more appropriate word than gratuitous. The shorter Oxford English Dictionary gives the following meaning to the word that is gratuitous. Freely bestowed or obtained, granted without claim or merit, costing nothing to the recipient, free. Two, done, made, adopted, or assumed, without any good grounds or reason, uncalled for, unjustifiable. And then paragraph 34 continues. The ordinary meaning of that word, and that's, that's still talking about gratuitous, yeah. in the context of making a disposition includes, I suggest, without obligation, for no return, without any quid pro quo, being given or expected. None of these meanings is incompatible with the coexistence of a motive for pure liberality or disinterested benevolence. So it seems that they assert that it's without obligation, yes. creating no rights, no entitlements. Quite so. Uh, I, I do not take issue with um, what the court construed to be what constitutes a gratuity. Yes. yes. Uh, the, the issue that I wish to debate with you is uh, the proposition that um, there can't be a legal basis to whether or not a person gets a gratuity. The case that I want to refer you to is the decision in Government Employees Pension Fund Provincial Government of Houghton against Beitendag, B-U-R-T-E-N-D-A-G and others. That's a, is that in one of the cited authorities? I, I don't believe I have seen that in your in your authorities. Uh, it's a 2007 decision. Um, uh, the, the the issue there um, was the following. I, I don't think it is right. included. We we'll uh, have to look at it. Yes, but more narrowly, the issue there was that. Um, uh, uh, the deceased was employed by the provincial government. Yes. Um, the, uh, in terms of the rules passed, uh, pension fund rules uh, passed in terms of the government employees pension law 1996, um, if you worked for more than 10 years, you became entitled to a gratuity uh, um, on your death. Now, you needed to have advised the fund of your beneficiaries, so you fill in the form. Um, what will then happen is the board then um, had a discretion as to which beneficiaries it would uh, um, um, as it were, give the gratuity to. So the point here is that um, the beneficiaries went to court asserting that they were not listed on the form. Some other beneficiaries were listed. They were not listed on the form, and they should have been listed because they had an entitlement to a gratuity. So now, the case seems to be against your fundamental submission that um, there can never be a legal basis to a gratuity because the nature of a gratuity is pure liberality. Pure liberality. Yes, I submit the following. I think I remember that judgment, and in fact, I don't know whether it's the one that ultimately turned on uh, administrative action, whether it's the SCA judgment that turned on whether the payment by the GPF was an administrative act or not, but I seem to remember coming across the judgment. Yeah, th this one didn't uh, um, deal with the issue of the nature of the, the conduct. decision by the GPF. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nevertheless, there are I, quite a number of those. Yes, yes. Never, nevertheless, I will consider that. Uh, my lord, I make uh, two submissions. The first submission is that there is a difference in relation to 
a surviving spouse or a child. So their rights may be immediately enforceable. In fact, this is a submission I will make in relation to this particular uh, clause we are dealing with. So the child would have a right, but the right of that child is dependent on whether or not the principal member <coughs> had a right. In other words, the principal beneficiary to the scheme had a right. But if you did have a right, that right passes on. So that factor is a crucial distinguishing factor. But it still doesn't answer the question as to whether or not the principal member has a right vis-a-vis -vis the scheme to a gratuity. Well, I think well, well, well um, in this instance, the principal member had a right yes. because the rule passed pursuant to the legislation made provision for that um, if you are employed by the government, in this instance the provincial government, for 10 years, on your death, you become entitled to, well, you be, well, you'll be dead. You become uh, eligible uh, or uh, entitled. Uh, sort of a, a gratuity will be due yes. uh, as a result of you having been employed for more than 10 years. Yes. Yes, no, I, th that's the second proposition. So the second proposition, first proposition, the right of, a, benef of a, a secondary member, let's call the child a secondary member, is dependent on the right of a principal member. And if a principal member is entitled, the secondary member is entitled. Now, as to whether or not a principal member is entitled, that is a matter of the construction of the instrument. And the construction of the instrument takes into account whether or not it is an obligatory payment or a gratuitous payment. It is true, uh, we submit, that there are gratuitous payments that are made obligatory, and that is the discretion of the employer. So <clears throat> the employer could say when it is drafting its rules, in our rules, we're going to make a gratuity obligatory, but it has a discretion to do that. But in the absence of that entitlement having been conferred by the employer in its rules, you have no right to a gratuity. Yeah, that, that would be so. Yes. But, but uh, again, the more fundamental issue which the court is debating with you is uh, in your head the making of a categorical statement. Yes, uh, no, which seems not to accord with at least this one decision. No, the categorical statement, my, my lord, is uh, defensible depending on what stage do you say the discretion is to be exercised. Once you've exercised your discretion to insert in the rules an entitlement for a gratuity, you have exercised that. The question is, absent that discretion, is there a right under the common law to a gratuity or not. Now, that is entirely different. Perhaps. Oh, yes. Now, th then I think we were debating the same point but coming from different angles. So the question is that absent a rule which is discretionary, can you make a claim for a gratuity? For instance, under the common law, there is an entitlement to a wage when service has been rendered. And that came after many, many arduous fights flowing from the law of master and servants, which did not entitle, did not always require remuneration. And then the common law developed that. Even if you have no contract of employment, no statute, but when you are rendering a service, there is a right to payment. In other words, that's not dependent on the discretion of an employer writing it into a rule. Yeah. Well, the, the, the court will accept as a correct statement of the law yes. that uh, that absent a rule, um, one can't claim it. Gratuity. Precisely. Yes. So, so this is the point that we we've been trying to pursue in these four judgments. If I may then proceed. Uh, Quantum Foods is the next judgment at paragraph seven point two. Um, it's an interesting judgment because what had happened there was that there had been a determination of a minimum wage. Uh, and the question was, what are the components that go into the minimum wage? Some employers 
were including into the minimum wage the gratuity payments, that they form part of that wage. And so when you are determining whether or not they have met the wage, let us say it's 4,000 rents, it is inclusive of the gratuity yes. payments. Except in, in quantum, what was included was a bonus, but yes. the court construed yes. bonus to be akin to a gratuitous, a, a gratuitous, a gratuitous payment. Uh, and then it relied on, uh, on Welsh. But, but the, 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 the principal point is this. If there is a payment that imposes no obligation and the employer disingenuously tries to insert it into the remuneration, the court decoupled that and then said this portion, this quote-unquote bonus portion, is not part of the minimum wage. And the reason they set out there, we've quoted it at paragraph 7.2, and I don't need to take your lordship through this because your lordship from the exchange is familiar with that passage. Um, what's crucial though about quantum is that it's outside of the tax authorities. It's in proper employment. Yes. And it's the same point made in S versus Commissioner of Texas. That's the Zimbabwe case at the time Southern Rhodesia, and the same point made in 7.4. Well, except as the commissioner, I consider that to be a misreading of um, what the appellate division said, um, and you debilious, and I believe that the Respondents misconstrued De Villiers on the issue as advanced in the in the submissions, um, because what the what the respondents say, your clients, what they say is that De Villiers is an authority for for that fundamental statement um, in the way that I had put it, uh, but that was not an issue for. Uh, decision. Do you recall that in De Villiers, it was an instance of the Attorney General whose term had come to an end, yes. and an amount was paid. He had, what, 136 days leave due to him uh, because his office had been determined he was paid an amount, and the receiver wanted his pound of flesh. The Attorney General said, well, um, that is not taxable because it was payment in solotium. The court disagreed and said um, the receiver had to have his due. Now, in the context of the submissions made as to um, uh, 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 a gratuity in the context of whether or not um, it could be claimed. Um, there were two judgments. Yes, there uh, is. Uh, by Vessels J.A. and, and Kalu. Yes. Uh, De Villiers agreed, uh, but did not make any statement. In the context of the case made in, in the heads, um, I believe that um, it's a misreading of what, in fact, um, um, Vessels said. Um, because Vessels said, in part that um, it made no difference whether the money paid to the Attorney General was a gratuity or a moral obligation or as a contractual right. Yes. So, so it didn't matter. Now on that statement, um, this decision can't support your um, uh, position in a way formulated in the head. Yes. Well, my lord, the, the submission made at 7.4 seems to accord with your lordship's reading. Because if I can take you to that passage, yeah. um, the submission that is made there is similarly in De Villiers versus Commissioner of Inland Revenue, the appellate division distinguished between a gratuity um, and payments made as a matter of contractual rights. Yes, but th that's precisely what they didn't do. Yes. Uh, uh, the 
appellate division wasn't making that determination. It wasn't drawing a distinction. It said it doesn't matter what label you place this payment under, yes. you still have to pay tax. Yes. Well, yes, my lord, I, I see your lordship's point. I mean, the, 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 there is though a clear statement in the passage, uh, which is at uh, 232, that seems to distinguish between payments made as a gratuity to those mo made as a moral obligation and then those made as a contractual right. And then I, I take your lordship's point that they said it doesn't matter if it is made as a gratuity, as a moral obligation, or out of contractual rights. So the point we were trying to make was that those three categories were set out as distinct from each other. Yes. And then, so that was De Villas, and then as versus Commissioner of Texas, that judgment you will find, again, your lordship is familiar with it, at zero, sorry, at 20, 1262, but the relevant passage is 20, 1271. And particularly at B to E. Yes, it, it references the Villiers, it but, mis but misreads it because yes. it, it, it suggests that uh, De Villiers decided the issue when in fact that wasn't the determination in De Villiers. Yes, my lord. What, what, yes, it, what it, yes, what it does say is uh, compatible with our submission. But if your lordship says, well, let's go back to De Villiers and see what it found. The submission we will make on De Villiers is that when they were determining the issue, they distinguished between the three categories of payments. In other words, they did not regard a gratuity as part of the contract. You know, it can't be. They didn't distinguish amongst the three categories. They said it doesn't matter. The label yes. doesn't matter. Yes. Because if the label doesn't matter, then one can't have a debate as to what heading yes. a, a particular aspect will fall under. Yes, no, I've taken that point. Uh, I, I still simply make the, the more modest point is that in that very statement, it classifies this into three. And then it says they are actually irrelevant for the case we have to decide. Yes. Yes. I suppose at best for you, what you could say about De Villiers is that it recognizes yes. uh, an instance of a gratuity, an instance of... Uh, um, moral obligation. Moral obligation. And then so contractual forth. obligation. I, I think that is the best that you could say. Yes. Uh, uh, De Villiers uh, recognized without, having, without deciding any yes. of that. Yes, and that is enough for the distinction I am trying to draw because I'm tr trying to draw a different distinction to whether or not the money in the hands of the villas would have been taxable. I'm trying to simply draw the distinction that conceptually the three are different and that court records them as conceptually distinct. Yes. And, and that's the only finding I will ask your Lordship to make, even in relation to S. Vessel's Commissioner of Texas. It's the conceptual distinction. And you will see this at A to G, which is at page 464 of the judgment, and page 20, stroke 1271. So to come back then to the point we make about the conditions is that when you see the word gratuity, absent a rule, there is no obligation. And the four judgments that we have cited, Welsh, Quantum, Commissioner of Texas, let's put aside the Villiers for a moment, at least the three judgments recognize that absent a rule, there is no obligation. And then De Villiers is supportive only in the limited sense of appreciating the conceptual distinction among those three terms. And the terms that are important for our purposes is contractual 
and gratuitous. So that's the first indicator. It's the heading and the meaning of a gratuity under the common law. Now, of course, the legislature could depart from the common law. Um, but if it wants to do so, it must be clear or be apparent from necessary inference that the intention was to depart from the common law. The second item here that is relevant is 3.1 itself, which is the condition of the payment of a gratuity. It's different from the nature of a gratuity, but the condition of the payment. And the condition of the payment of the gratuity is vacation of office. Now, again, this needs some explication, the idea of a vacation of office. The starting point is section 193 of the Constitution. Um, so, the Lordship has seen the, the provision of the Constitution from the Uh, from the case line references. So under section 182, sorry, 183, which you will find at item 20, 1974, The public protector is appointed for a non-renewable period of seven years. So after seven years, they vacate office. So that much is clear. It's a constitutionally prescribed term limit. Then there is another category of a vacation of office which is recognized in the Public Protector Act. So if I can ask your Lordship to go to, the Act itself appears at item 20, 2052. So we know number one, on vacation of office. Vacation of office, you, you've completed your term under section 193 of, of, the, uh, of the Constitution. And then the second which actual vacation of office is in the Act itself at section 2, subsection 3. And that is at page 20, stroke 2055. And that sets out two instances of vacation of office. So instance number one is regulated by section 193 of the constitution, lapse of your term of office. Instance number two is regulated by the statute, which says under section two, subsection three, the National Assembly, or if parliament is not in session, the committee may allow a public protector to vacate his or her office, A, on account of continued ill health. So. Ill health, as your lordship knows, is incapacity. So if the public protector is too ill to work, they may ask the National Assembly to allow them to vacate office before the lapse of the prescribed term for the vacation of office. So that's the second category of the vacation. It's at the discretion of the National Assembly upon the application by the public protector. And then number two, at his or her request, provided that such request shall be addressed to the National Assembly or to the committee, as the case may be, at least three calendar months prior to the date on which he or she wishes to vacate office. And for the committee, as the case may be, allows a shorter period in a specific case. So this is a resignation. So. So we now have 
three constitutionally and statutorily recognized methods of vacating office. The term ends under section 193, or you are ill, in which event the, public, the, the committee may allow you to leave, or you resign, provided you've given a three months notice to the resignation, you may be allowed. Then there is a fourth category of vacation, which is also referred to in the instrument itself, which is 18 stroke 39, paragraph 3.2 of the instrument, which is it, vacation by death. Instrument being what? The, the conditions the, of the service. Yes. Oh, no, no, the conditions of service. No, yes. the conditions. Right, 3.2. Which is vacation by death. Now, that's not a, a, a vacation, it's a deemed vacation, but it's nevertheless vacation by death. And you will see that it's a deemed vacation from item 3.2 itself. And I'll come back to the arguments made about the use of the word shall in that section because it's again a product of a misinterpretation. But 3.2 says, the surviving spouse of the public protector who died before his or her term of office as public protector has expired shall be paid an amount e equal to the amount of the gratuity, which would have, in terms of paragraph 3.1, have been payable to the public protector had she or he not died, but on the date of his or her death vacated his or her office in terms of that paragraph. So, although you have not completed your term, but you are dead, and that is then deemed as a vacation of office. So there are the four categories of vacation. So there is no other category that is recognized in the Constitution, in the Act, or in the instrument. There are only four. So to recap what they are, it's vacation by completion of the office under Section 193 of the Constitution, vacation at the instance of Parliament on account of ill health or incapacity, Vacation by resignation, provided that three-month notice is given, and vacation by death. So we then come back to clause 3.1. The condition for the payment is vacation. And vacation is a term that is recognized in law. What is clear about this idea of the vacation of office is that it is different from removal. And removal is not included in vacation. And this was not an error because vacation was dealt with in the act it was dealt with in the rules. And of course it is in the constitution because the term is seven, seven years, non-renewable. So it's not an error, it's not an omission. Vacation is a specific, those are the four categories of vacation. Now removal is completely different because it is to be found in section 194 of the Constitution. Sorry, uh, yes. Uh, I said 193. It's 183, of which is, which is the tenure. Removal is section 194, which you will find at item 20, stroke 1977. So, which you may be removed on the ground of misconduct, incapacity, or incompetence, or there may be a finding to that effect by a committee of the National Assembly and see the adoption by the Assembly of a resolution calling for that person's removal from office. Now, we know that if the, 
issue is incapacity. It's dealt with in the Act, Section 2, Subsection 2, as a vacation, a category of vacation of office. It's legislated. The categories that are not legislated is misconduct and incompetence. Not legislated, not provided for anywhere. And the Act could have made this plain because when it was dealing with vacation, which you will see at item 20 stroke 2055, Item 3, section 2, subsection 3, it only chose ill health. That's the only category it chose, ill health. So this is all a deliberate drafting policy by the government. Uh, by parliament. then look at vacation, or that vacation has a distinct meaning, distinct meaning, which is different from the removal from office on the grounds that I've articulated to your lordship. And we know that even in removal, the legislature has done this job for us because it's lifted out one category, which is ill health, and dealt with it as a subset of vacation. So that's the second indicator from the grounds of vacation, uh, the grounds of uh, payment of a gratuity, which is vacation from office, and what that means. And then you have the third indicator coming from item 3.2. Now, this does not create an entitlement to the primary holder of the office, not an entitlement to the public protector. It's an entitlement to the surviving spouse. It says, the surviving spouse of the public protector who died before his or her term of office as a public protector has expired, right, shall be paid an amount equal to the amount of the gratuity, which would, in terms of paragraph 3.1, have been payable to the public protector had he or she not died, but on the date of his or her death vacated his or her office in terms of that paragraph. So this is what we call vacation by death because it uses the term vacate. But the shall is not referring to the public protector. It is referring to the surviving spouse. What it is simply saying is that the surviving spouse has a right to whatever the public protector would have been entitled to. But to know whether the public protector is entitled, you go to in terms of paragraph 3.1 above, which would have been payable in terms of paragraph 3.1 above. So there is no substantive self-standing entitlement flowing from clause 3.2. It, in fact, reinforces the submission I made to your lordship that the departure point is clause 3.1, which tells you the conditions under which gratuity may be considered. So in order for you to know, should I pay the public protector, you always go to a gratuity, you always go to 3.1. And again, what it does do is that it again reinforces the point about death being a category of vacation. So it's a dimmed vacation, which is the fourth of my four categories of vacation. And then it obviously sets out that uh, uh, formula. Then the fourth uh, textual indicator is you will find at page 1841, 18 stroke 41, which is item 8.11, which deals with transport and subsistence allowance. That's a different category of benefits. But the important point here is that 8.11 distinguishes in terms 
between removal from office, vacation of his or her office, the death of the public uh, protector. Now, we of the protector is a deemed remover, is a deemed vacation, but it's a special category. So it's not tautologous to use that. And then the vacation of his or her office, we know that there is vacation because the term has ended. And there are also two categories of vacation, which is incapacity and resignation. But then there's removal from office, which is a category apart. And it's recognized in the instrument itself, which is 8.11 Roman figure 1. Now, my learned friend knew yesterday that this was a difficulty for him. And when he was asked, why did the legislature, uh, why did the, the uh, uh, instrument say um, removal from office and then vacation from office, if vacation is such a capacious term that it incorporates removal? Uh, and then he said it was because it was tautologous. The problem, of course, is that the law um, contains a presumption against interpreting statutes to produce tautology. Yes. We have found the judgment on the point, which is item 20, stroke 2176. And the judgment is called African Products. 20, yes, forgive me, 20, what page number? 2176, my lord. 2176. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so the judgment is African Products versus AIG South Africa Limited. The... The relevant paragraph is 12 and 13. So what it makes clear yes, paragraph 13 actually, which is more direct on the issue of tautology. It says, since the words, and those were words, I think, in an insurance contract, yes, since the words unforeseen and sudden are joined by the conjunctive end, the physical damage to the cables must have been both unforeseen and sudden. And because the two words may, depending on the context, bear the same meaning, and then look at what happens next, they must each be given a meaning that will avoid tautology or superfluity. In Wellworth's Bazaars versus Chandelier's LTD and others, this court quoted with approval the following passage from the decision of the Privy Council. In Dietscher versus It is a good general rule in jurisprudence that one who reads a legal document, whether public or private, should not be prompt to ascribe should not without necessity or some sound reason impute to its language tautology or superfluity, and should be rather at the outset inclined to suppose every word intended to have some effect or to be of some use. A court should thus be slow to conclude that words in a single document are tautologous or superfluous. So once you see Removal from office as a standalone phrase. The rule is it is not intended to be tautologous. It's intended to contain a self standing meaning. And here, in context, we say you are required to obviously bear in mind 
words from different aspects of the same instrument when you are inter interpreting the instrument because interpretation is a composite task. So to sum up then, the fourth textual indicator that removal is not included in vacation and where vacation overlapped with removal, it was dealt with in the legislation. The fact that the instrument itself separated removal is a clear, we submit, with respect, coherent and logical indication that removals for misconduct and incompetence were not intended to clothe the removed person with any entitlement to a gratuity. Now, those four textual indicators have not been meaningfully addressed by our learned friends. There was a lot of hand-waving and no jurisprudential engagement. So, in sum, on the text of the instrument, they are not entitled to a gratuity. On the text of the instrument that they themselves, on the 6th of December 2023, claimed was a basis for their entitlement, they have not shown their entitlement. And so when the public protector responded to them on the 12th of uh, February 2024 and said, I cannot find any legal basis that would authorize me to make a payment. She was correct, I'm afraid. What then remains? And so the, the claims, I mean, there they, they were a lot of uh, emotional statements made yesterday that it was punishment, it was a reflection of bias, etc., etc. They are all irrelevant because this is a dispassionate analysis of whether the instrument that she relies on confers an entitlement to a gratuity. And here, my Lord, I need to state one more thing before I depart from this, which is the debate whether in general a gratuity confers an entitlement or not is not dispositive of this topic because we have considered from the onset that it is a matter of the construction of the instrument in, in question. Some instruments may entitle one, others may not entitle one, but the instrument that has been cited here as the basis simply does not confer the right in question. And again, without prejudice to what Mr. Mutau is about to say, that is why it is unhelpful to use the judge's conditions of service to resolve this case. There is a case that will come, I don't know if it will or it will not, of a removed judge or an impeached judge. That case must be dealt with in the future. It's not part of this dispute today. Now, if the conditions of service, as we have painstakingly analyzed them, do not confer a right to a gratuity in respect of a public protector who has been removed from his conduct and incompetence, as I have shown. What else does the applicant say is the basis for the entitlement? Now, Lordship, I've shown that at the time of the application, the only instrument that was cited were the conditions of service. Obviously, the case has expanded quite significantly, both in the pleadings as well as in the in the heads of argument. We don't begrudge them that because a case does evolve. And it may not be an excuse for us to say that's not what you requested if they come along and say, I can show that under the statute I have a right. They must be paid. Uh, Mr. Ndekobi and uh, just from a, a logical point of view, at least in the mind of the court, um, before you address the court on um, 
what the respondents say are the applicants are the basis for the entitlement. It seems to me that um, it makes logical sense um, for you to address the court on the or one of the alternatives uh, relief, namely um, that clause three is contrary to public morals, is a breach of the constitution, and uh, is a breach of the rule of law. Um, that way, you would have in a in a in a single uh, session, as it were, you would have dealt with it. Easily, un unless one of your juniors is going to deal with that aspect. Well, it, actually, it's 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 more elevated than that. It's, <laughs> it's Mr. Mutau who will deal with that. <laughs> yes. I, I'm not suggesting that Mr. Mutau is a junior. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, right, but, it, but it, I'm it, happy it, to then deal with the BCA. Uh, uh, all right, yes. Because yes. that follows after the section that Mr. Mutau will deal with. Yes, all right. Well, then we'll leave that for Mr. Mutau to, yes. to, to, to address. To deal with. My Lord, then. The PCEA itself is at, again, the, the whole statute is here to uh, copy. The PCEA is at 1860, uh, 1856, that's, uh, sorry, item 20, 1856, that's where the act appears. Firstly, if uh, I can ask you, Lordship, forgive me, before you start your address, um, what the applicant has pleaded in relation to the BCEA um, is the following, that section 32.3b doesn't say that she's not entitled to a gratuity. That's one aspect. Second aspect is that the condition of service embodies the employment contract mentioned in the BCEA. I've paraphrased that part. And the third aspect relating to the BCEA is that the decision was a breach of the BCEA. So when you make your address, if you could comprehend those three aspects. Yes. Thank you, my Lord. I'm indebted to the Lordship's guidance. So the, the first question on the BCEA is whether it applies or not to the relationship, because it can't ground a cause of action if it's of no application. And you see at item 20, stroke 1864, Section 3, it says this act applies to all employees and employers except the excluded categories. So the first issue is the public protector has to prove that she is an employee. Now, we know that from the analysis I did at the outset, the Public Protector Act was amended in 2019 to remove references in the old section 2, subsection 2 of the Public Protector Act. References to employment. And we also know that the two judgments that have come from the Western Cape High Court, where she had asserted that she's an employee, have made it clear that she's not an employee. But we also know from the scheme of the Constitution that the holder of the office of the public protector is an independent constitutional office bearer that is responsible for investigation and reporting on maladministration under Section 181 of the Constitution. She simply cannot be an employee. She is meant to oversee the state, which on her articulation is her employer. So 
Because she cannot establish that she is an employee, the entire cause of action that is founded on the BCEA must be rejected. It would be incongruent if your lordship found that the public protector is an employee. It would be utterly destructive of the constitutional scheme because it would mean that the independent holder of an office established by Chapter 9 of the Constitution is somehow subservient to the state. And that would be destructive of that office and the role that it plays. Now, on the assumption that the court makes precisely that very finding, um, what are your submissions in relation to the issues as pleaded? Yes, I want to then go to the alternative yes. the submission. The substantive basis for the is section 32, which your lordship will find at item 20 stroke 1877. Section 32 one says an employer must pay to an employee any remuneration that is paid in money. And then item section 32 subsection 3, an employer must pay remuneration not later than seven days after the completion of the period for which the remuneration is payable or the termination of the contract of employment. So in this instance, we know that she has been removed. But you then go back to what does remuneration mean? Because it's remuneration that must be paid, not any other thing. So you find the definition at item 20 stroke 1863. And it says remuneration means any payment in money or in kind, or both in money and in kind, made or owing to any person in return for that person working for any other person. So it is your classic salary, money in exchange of services. It is not inclusive of gratuities because unless provided for in a rule, gratuities are not part of a salary or a remuneration. And this in fact is distinguishable completely even from section two of the Public Protector Act. Yes. Before you deal with section two, you will recall Mr. Bofu making the submission that um, rather that a gratuity must be construed to fall under the heading of benefit which forms part of uh, re the remuneration. Yes, well firstly that is not the case under the definition of remuneration of the BCEA because as the Lordship pointed out we've now also found the determination made in section 35. So if you go to section 35, because we're trying to work out how do I calculate remuneration and the wage, and you'll see that it's at item 20, stroke 1879, and particularly 35, subsection 5. The minister may, by notice in the Gazette, after consultation with the Commission and Network, determine whether a particular category of payment, whether in money or kind, forms part of an employee's remuneration for the purposes of any calculation made in terms of this act. And we couldn't see a later determination than 2003. But the 2003 determination is at item 20, 2174. And 
item 2 sub c excludes gratuities now i know that when the item was debated yesterday uh, mr bofu attempted to reduce gratuity into a tip but it is a fallacious argument because it converts the genus by reference to the example. Whereas the real issue is that the gratuity is excluded in whatever guise that it emerges. So it does not help to be dismissive uh, on the part of Mr. Mpofu when he's confronted with a difficult question. Well, I mean, it's actually worse when he is now accusing the court of reducing it into a tip. Yes, you may, con you may continue, yes, Mr. Thank, thank you, my lord. I, I'm indebted to the court. So, we then have three arguments about the BCEA. Argument number one is that the BCA is inapplicable. Argument number two is that the definition of remuneration under section 32 and the section on definitions does not include gratuities. Argument number three, the BCA itself confers the power on the minister to determine what's included and excluded and that determination has been made gratuities are excluded. So the declaration, therefore, that is based on the BCEA is a non-starter. Um, my Lord, the, the time is 11.08. I'm just not sure whether I've not exceeded your Lordship's patience. Uh, no, not at all. Um, have you concluded your address in relation to the, the BCA? BCA. Did, so so you will then revert to the aspect that you wish to yes. um, uh, yes. address the court on, i.e. other basis for the entitlement? Indeed. So I needed to go back then. So what I have done is a, a full analysis, hopefully, uh, a helpful one, of the conditions of service. Uh, forgive me. Are you about to start then that new aspect? Yes. Other basis? Yes. Right. Well, um, what the court will do, we'll take its break now. And, yes, there's a lot of um, We will resume at um, 20 past 11. Indeed. The court will rise.